Hello everyone and thank you for joining. My name is Erica and I'm going to be your host today um, for the webinar on QT and Python, 3000 hours of developer insight. Uh, before I hand it over to our speakers, I'm just going to go through a quick couple of house cleaning items. First of all, we are recording this event and we'll be making it available to participants within the next couple business days. Um, so if you have any questions or are looking for this afterwards, we will be providing that to you along with the slides. Secondly, we are going to have a live Q&A at the end of the um, session. So if you could please put those questions as you're going through into the Q&A box, that'd be greatly appreciated. You can find that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. It should look like a, just a square Q and then have Q&A underneath that. So with that, um, I'm going to hand this over to one of our product managers here, Harold, and have him do the introductions for our talk today. Thank you, Erica. So everyone, welcome. My name is uh, Harold and I'm uh, the product manager for Qt for Application Development with the Qt company. And today we have the great honor of having with us uh, Michael Hermann from Vienna in Europe. Uh, and he will be the master of this, uh, of this webinar. Uh, so Michael Hermann, he is uh, the creator of uh, the file manager Fman. And uh, for, on that, uh, he also found he wanted to create uh, FBS, which is a build system for, well, he will come back to that. Uh, Michael is uh, a master of science in software. And of course, he's also a great software solopreneur uh, doing his own company. He's been an enthusiast for Python and developers since 2012. And of course, he's a cute evangelist. And that's also why we have invited cute or sorry Michael here today. So with that, I think we will get cracking, Michael. Yes, thank you, Harald. Um, so hello to everyone also from my side. And I'd like to welcome you by answering why you should actually be watching um, this talk. Suppose you're a software company and say you have the developed a desktop application, so an app that runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux. And you have most of the code ready, and now you want to give it, you want to launch it. You want to bring it into the hands of your users. Um, so you want to, for your users to be able to download it from your website and install it, and you want the process to be smooth. There shouldn't be no warnings or similar things. Uh, maybe you also want um, automatic updates so that once you've released version one, you can um, soon after release a version two with improvements. So the question is, how long will that likely take you? So going from just a few source code of, of your app to being your users being able to download it from your website for the three platforms with automatic updates. And we'll see later that the answer to this question um, is likely maybe two to three months. Um, and the point of this presentation is that I can show you how to do it in one day. But before I do that, I'd like to tell you my story. As Harold said, I'm the uh, creator of Fman. It's a file manager, so you use it as an alternative to Finder on, Win uh, on Mac or Explorer on Windows. So you browse directories, you copy files, you unpack zip archives, you upload files, and so on and so forth. You can see a screenshot here. Um, as I said, it's uh, available on all operating systems, and I created it and in 2016, so I've been working on it since, um, because I was um, coming from Windows to Mac, and I had been using a total commander, which is a, another file manager on Windows, and it, no good alternative to total commander was available on Mac. And so after some research, and not being able to find a better uh, alternative for Mac, I decided to create my own. And I had a very specific um, idea in mind of what it should look like. So my goals were at the time, and knew it was going to be a large and long-term project, um, that I wanted to create um, this file manager. It should be cross-platform, so Windows, Mac, and Linux. It should be fast. Um, it should, should support a custom styles or a custom user interface. You saw in the screenshot I just showed you, 
that it has a very it has a dark mode and it already had that dark mode three years ago um, and only now many so for instance mac os uh, the latest update uh, also introduced dark mode so fman already had it back then <laughs> um, but fman itself took inspiration and actually does take a lot of inspiration from sublime text which is a popular text editor um, but uh, it was important for Fman to have a unique user interface. And another important um, goal and aspect and consideration was that um, Fman needed to be easy and fast to develop. Um, I have limited resources and it was important that I spend them wisely and that I make choices that allow me to get the most done in the shortest amount of time. So when I started FMAN in 2016, I thought, okay, how will I uh, de develop this graphical user interface? Um, my first idea was to write my own custom rendering engine in C++. Um, that's what Sublime Text does. And while that is extremely fast, it is also very, very expensive to develop. And I would argue even more expensive to develop for a file manager than for a text editor, because I feel like a file manager has more widgets and buttons and a table um, which lists the files is maybe more complex, which of course isn't to say that Sublime Text user interface is not complex, but I was I dreaded having to write um, such a complex user interface in pure C++ from scratch. On the other end of the spectrum would have been Electron. So as many people probably know, Electron is um, a technology, a browser-based technology for creating cross-platform desktop applications. The way it works is that you essentially ship a version of Chrome, of the Chrome browser as your desktop application and use web technologies such as JavaScript and HTML and CSS to create your own application on top of it. So to the user, it looks like a native application, and, but under the hood, it's actually a browser. And um, because Chrome or Chromium, which Chrome is based on, is very mature, of course, and very heavily optimized, and it generally works very, very well. Um, but the drawback is that it's very resource intensive. So when I evaluated this technology uh, on an old machine uh, in 2016, it took five seconds uh, just to start a Hello World app uh, that was written in Electron. And that was way too slow um, for, for a file manager that you want to, be op want to open often and quickly. And um, so I decided that I could not use Electron. I must also admit that I'm personally not the biggest fan of JavaScript, and I was not too sad um, to be able to uh, forego that choice on other grounds. So I considered several, several other GUI frameworks, um, but they were either too slow or not cross-platform, or they did not support custom UI styles in um, enough of an extent um, as I needed. Um, until I hit up on Qt, and Qt ticks all the boxes. It's cross-platform, it has great performance, it supports custom styles that are also uniform across operating systems, and uh, it enables fast development, especially if you use it with Python. Um, if you, I assume most people in the audience will know Python, but I, maybe some people have not used it yet. So Python is much easier to write than C++. It's much more concise. It's much easier to read because it's more concise. Uh, the syntax is more lightweight. Um, these things lead to much faster development um, with Python. So I personally feel a lot more productive in Python than in most other languages. Um, the trade-off is that Python is a lot slower to execute, um, but you can work around that by combining Python with C++. So you can call native code from Python and 
what you can do is you write most of your application, say, in Python, and then those parts that are performance critical, you rewrite in C++ or C. And that way, you get the productivity of Python um, while retaining the speed of C++. And the final point is that Python is a dynamic programming language. So if you're coming from, say, a C++ background, which is a statically typed uh, language, like where the compiler gives you errors and warnings if, you, if your variables and method parameters do not have the correct types. In Python, that's not the case. Uh, it's, Python does not, work, does not even have a compiler, um, and variables can change their type at runtime. Not that you would usually want to do that, um, but the fact that you don't have, type, have to declare types um, is one of the reasons why Python is so easy to read and write. And it also avoids a lot of the typical object-oriented um, problems in statically typed programming languages where you think a lot about, okay, how am I going to fit this problem of mine into a class hierarchy? But then what if, what if there are collections and then I need generics and then it breaks down at some point and so I need to cast anyways. And so Python forgoes all that. And many people coming from statically typed programming languages um, are a bit wary of that. They want to know um, what types a, a method parameter has or what type a parameter has. And that is, of course, that's understandable, but good coding style can help a lot um, to clarify the type of a variable, say, if you just use a good name. Um, and in my experience, it's never really been a problem. Um, I've always found it clear. Um, and also in more recent Python versions, you can annotate uh, method parameters, for instance, with the type they have. So the syntax of Python has been extended. So you can add type annotations. Um, so you still get the same benefit. To control Qt um, from Python, you need Python bindings. So that's essentially a Python library that lets you uh, call Qt's API, create win windows, uh, widgets, and so on and so forth. The traditional Python bindings uh, were PyQt, and um, they're still around. They're very mature, they're very stable. I think PyQt is 15 or 20 years old by now. It's fast, it works very, very well. Its drawback is that it's licensed under the GPL, uh, which means that if you want to use it for a commercial application, you usually need to buy a commercial license. Um, the price is currently around $500. Um, so that's a drawback. A recent development on very great push is for another alternative set of Python bindings called PySites2, which are now officially supported by the Qt company. And their advantage is that they are licensed under the LGPL, which means you can also use them in commercial projects without having to buy a license. Um, the fact that they're officially supported by the, and backed by the Qt company means that these findings will likely be the future. Um, and often you, when you read about them online, you also see them mentioned as Qt for Python. And the reason there's the second name is that Qt for Python is the term, the umbrella term, which the Qt company use for all their Python related projects. So PySite 2 is one of those projects. And uh, as far as I know, at the moment, the main or most important one, but there might be others in the future. So um, if online you read Qt for Python, you can currently treat it as almost an add um, another name for PySets too, and it's often how people use it. But in the future, um, it may also mean other things. So uh, the question I asked in my very first slide, so what do you have to do? How long does it take to release your app? What actually, which steps actually go into doing that? So the first step is that you want to convert your Python code uh, into a standalone executable. So you want to turn app.py into app.exe. Um, 
that gives you, so in the C++ world, for instance, that would be compiling uh, your application. Uh, in Python, it's, it has a different name. But once you've done that, in, in, in the second step uh, is that you'd like to create an installer. So you want your users to be able to download this installer and start it, and then they get a wizard and they click next, 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 and maybe the installer creates some start menu entries or changes other registry values. Um, so it's just an easy way for your users to um, install your app. And of course, that doesn't just exist on Windows. Um, it, it there also you also want an installer on Mac, so that would typically be a .dmg file which people download. And on Linux, for instance, on Ubuntu, it would be a .deb um, package. Um, so these are the native uh, and common installers on these platforms, and you want to create them because you want to make it easy for your users to install your app. Then when a user downloads um, your application um, from the internet, then if, unless you take special measures, they will see a dialogue such as the one on the right here, which says, FMAN can't be opened because it is from an unidentified developer. So this is a warning by the operating system that's meant to prevent the spread of viruses and malware. And of course, as the software provider, you would not like you would like to get rid of this warning. And the way to do this is via code signing. This digitally signs uh, your binaries, your application, to tell the uh, operating system who the creator and who the author is. So this way, the operating system can know. Okay, um, this application was created by a reputable source, so I do not have to treat it as dangerous. And finally, um, modern applications um, on, as, I mean, mo mobile apps all have automatic updates via the app stores. And um, also web applications are very easy to update. You just release a new version to the, to the server and immediately all current users who access your site have it. And we would also like this for desktop applications. Um, the reason for this is that it, really changes the development process and the development cycle. If you can, if you're able to release uh, new versions quickly through automatic updates without requiring your users to go to your website and download or maybe even uninstall a previous version and so on and so forth, you're able to a, get feedback from users much more quickly. So you program the feature, you implemented the feature last week and now you released it and Already a week later, your users are telling you uh, whether they like it or not. And B, um, you are able to react to that feedback much more quickly. Um, so if they say they don't like it, then you can scrap it quickly, for instance, or change it. And what it also helps with is uh, finding bugs. So if the version you released yesterday had a bug, but the version you released a week ago did not have that bug, then you only look, need to look through the source code changes um, that you made in the past week and not in the past year to find out where the bug um, is caused. And so all these things together make for a much smoother um, and more uh, a development process that is also much closer to the user. And so it's extremely beneficial. So we really do want automatic updates. The first step, um, which was to turn the Python source code into a standalone ex executable. So for instance, an a.exe file on Windows is called freezing in the Python world. Um, so in C++, it will be compiling. Um, They're not exactly the same, but they produce the same end result. And there are many Python libraries that let you do this. So there's one called py2exe and then one called py2app and cx underscore freeze. Uh, they're all, I've tried them all, and they don't really work that great. And, but there is one that works very well, and that is PyInstaller. Um, it's very stable, it's actively developed, it's cross-platform, so it works for all operating systems. But even though it's great, um, it's not perfect. It, 
it usually only gets you 80% of the way there. So maybe uh, it will, so if you have your Python code and you have some dependencies, then maybe it will take you a day uh, to learn PyInstaller, learn read this documentation, learn its command line arguments, maybe learn how to include those dependencies of your app, um, these things. So maybe that might take you a day. And then you really publish your app and some users download it and a few hundred start using it, maybe a thousand. But one or two are saying, hey, your app it doesn't start on my Windows machine. And you don't know why. And so you, because you can't reproduce the problem on your machine, you email back and forth with them and you try to beat back and, and you try and you send them snapshot versions and ask, hey, does this work? No, does this work? Okay. And eventually you realize why it doesn't work. And the reason why it doesn't work is that um, PineStaller does not include all the required DLLs for Windows. So, um, <clears throat> so you add those special DLLs after maybe a day of, of, of work. And then you're happy, except that some Linux users say, hey, um, I'm on Ubuntu 16 and it doesn't work. But the users who are on Ubuntu 18 say, yeah, it works without problems. And so you debug again and you debug for another day until you realize, okay, in this case, PyInstaller includes a few too many shared libraries, which are incompatible with older Ubuntu versions. So you take care to remove these libraries before shipping your um, application to your users, because then when your application is run, um, it picks up the uh, version of the library that is provided by the user's operating system, and that is of course compatible. But that again takes another day of maybe uh, of work. Um, I mean, network. Usually, it's uh, spread out over maybe days or weeks uh, when you as you're trying to reach those users and trying to figure out why things are not working. But I would say that after three days or so of uh, full-time work, um, you have managed to compile your Python source code to standalone executable on the three main operating systems, and uh, things are working. Then the next step, um, creating an installer. Um, as I mentioned before, on Windows, that's typically an executable, app setup.exe. It's, this, it's that such a typical wizard where, where says welcome and then please click next and please choose the install location and, and so on and so forth. And there are also <clears throat> several tools for creating such wizards and installers. Uh, the most uh, well-known ones are Ensys and Pino Setup. And uh, they have their own, I mean, they have their own configuration and you read their manual and they have their own scripting language and so Maybe after a day or so of, after learning about them, one of them, say Ansys, you have something, you have an installer that you can ship to your users. Except then after a while, some users say, hey, um, I want to install this with admin privileges or, or, or you realize that the app needs to be with admin privileges, but the user, when you just double clicks your installer, um, he is just installing it as a normal user. Um, and so you look, you learn more about the scripting language and you dig through into the documentation and you browse online forums and you see, ah, okay, I have to uh, request, tell the installer to requ request elevated permissions. So maybe that's another day um, of debugging where um, you learn about this tool that you're using. And, but I would say after two days, you, you have a stable installer on Windows um, that lets you do what you want. On Mac, um, the typical format for distributing packages uh, or applications are .dmg files. Uh, they're essentially self-extracting archives. Um, there are also on the, um, open source tools that let you create those files. Um, one is, for instance, called create-dmg. Um, so it's a command line tool. You you download it, you learn its command line options and which flags you have to set, how to place an icon um, in, in that um, DMG file, and so on and so forth. But it's a bit easier to run on Windows, so maybe after a day, uh, you have such a DMG file for your application. 
Then on Linux, um, it, it differs from distribution to distribution, but what's common is that they all have native package managers uh, that take certain uh, files as input. So on Ubuntu or Debian-based systems, that's uh, dev files. On Fedora and CentOS, it's RPM uh, files. And on Arch Linux, it's package.par.x set files. Um, so these are essentially archives with special metadata uh, inside them. And there is a tool called, an open source tool called FPM that lets you generate them. Um, it's a great tool. Um, again, it has a lot of command line arguments that you need to learn and you need to figure out which ones you have to set and to which values. And um, yeah, so it, it, it takes maybe, maybe a day. And then you test, of course, uh, the archives that are, or the packages that are created that way. You learn more about your uh, package manager. So say you're on Ubuntu, then you learn in the process about apt and ppackage. Um, so these are command line tools for installing uh, exactly those step files. But then, of course, you have to do the same on the other uh, main Linux distributions, uh, which are generally Fedora and Arch Linux. Um, and so you also learn about their, uh, and need to learn about their package managers. So uh, for Fedora or CentOS, uh, the package, um, the command line tools are YAM and DNF. So maybe that takes half a day to learn. And then on Arch Linux, uh, the package manager is called Pacman. Um, and maybe that takes another half a day. So all these tools, all these package managers essentially uh, have the same goal and achieve the same task, but they're all slightly different. And so you need to learn about them all if you want to support them. The next step is code signing. Um, as I mentioned before, that's required to avoid uh, warnings by the user's operating system that your app is untrusted. Um, on Windows, uh, this requires a so-called code signing certificate. It's a little bit like an SSL certificate. Uh, you buy it from a certificate authority who then essentially vouches uh, for you. Um, but before they do that, they need to, uh, they require you to prove to them that you are who you really claim to be. And so it involves some bureaucracy, <clears throat> excuse me. And that takes about a day, um, but it's not one day, eight hours, but it's a bit spread out. So you, you apply and then they send you an email and then a few days later they send you another email and so on and so forth. And then once you have the certificate, you need to install it on your machine, you need to import it you know, on your machine. And then there are command line tools on Windows that lets you actually use the certificate to sign uh, your application, your binaries. And then it's not, you have to also, uh, it's still a bit more involved because you don't just sign exe files, but you need to sign TLLs as well, for instance. And further, you usually don't want to just use um, the default signing process uh, because last I checked, it only used the uh, SHA-1 um, hashing algorithm, but you also want for maximum compatibility, you also want SHA-256. Uh, so again, a bit more stuff you need to learn and maybe it, it, it'll take you another day. On Apple, it's a bit easier because the certificates, uh, I mean, on macOS, uh, it's a bit easier because the certificates are provided by Apple themselves and their the process is a lot less uh, bureaucratic. Um, so you can do it in a day, but it still comes with details you need to figure out. Um, in particular, on macOS, applications are essentially directories with a .app um, extension and these directories have a certain subdirectory structure. So there's a subdirectory for the for executables, there's a subdirectory for shared libraries, there's a subdirectory for resource files, data files, and you need to you need to adhere to this directory structure or else code signing won't work. So you'll also part of this one day will be spent or like can be spent um, by you figuring out, okay, I might do have the correct directory structure and what do I need to change maybe in my build process to make it adhere to uh, 
the required structure and so on and so forth. So again, it's you need to learn about it. It's another tool. Um, you dig through the documentation and, and after a while you figure it out. On Linux, um, the default solution for not just for code signing, but also for encryption, for instance, is GPG. There, there's no one central certificate authority that issues uh, certificates. Rather, everyone can generate their own certificates. And it's pretty easy to generate their own certificate and it's not too difficult to then use it to code sign your application or your, uh, your binaries. So you, I guess you can do it in a day. But then the problem is that um, it's really, really hard to take your GPG key, export it and import it onto another machine. So of course it's possible by the command line, but it's surprisingly difficult. Um, it's apparently not something that is done extremely often. And further, so, and you need to do that because you typically sign, so say you start on Ubuntu, you generate a GPG key there, you sign your Ubuntu package on Ubuntu, but then you also have, for instance, an Arch Linux package, and you want to sign that there. And the Arch Linux package is generated on Arch. So you need to somehow get this GPG key onto your Arch uh, Linux machine. And it, so it's, it takes a lot of, it's, GPG makes these things very hard. And also um, the different distributions, Linux distributions use different versions of GPG which are inconsistent with one another. So they're subtly different and they don't just have different command line arguments. Whose, and it's not just that the names are different, but it's also that the values you need to pass in are different. So you can easily spend another two, three days um, just figuring these things out. Um, I have spent those days and it's, it's been, um, um, I must say, unnecessarily painful, but that's how it was. And automatic updates. As I said, we really want automatic updates. They're really great for our development cycle and development speed. Um, there are Python libraries that let you do this. Um, there, there is one called SKEY. Uh, it sounds so promising. It, sound, it says, yeah, automatic updates for your standalone Python applications. It sounds amazing. Fortunate, unfortunately, it doesn't work very well in practice. Um, it's also now no longer maintained. Uh, it recommends a different library, a more recent one called PyUpdater. But I'm skeptical um, because every, every update mechanism that is part of the application that is to be updated will run into limitations. For instance, say your app was installed as an admin user, but is then run as a, a user with non-admin privileges and the, it tries to update itself. Then it can't because it would need to override the admin protected files. Um, and another limitation is that on Windows, um, you cannot override um, executables that are currently being executed, that are currently running. So if an XE file on Windows tried to override itself while it was running, it would uh, fail. So um, I have not used PyUpdater myself, but I'm skeptical. Um, on Windows, um, there are many uh, or several frameworks that you can use for automatic updates. Um, the most powerful one is Google Omaha. Another one is WinSparkle. Um, I have not used WinSparkle. I have used Google Omaha and Omaha is, as I said, extremely powerful. It's the technology which Google used to update Chrome on Windows. The problem is uh, it's very difficult to set up. Uh, so it involves a client and a server and setting up the client is not easy. It takes maybe five days um, because you have to compile the, basically you have to modify and compile the C++ source code of the client. And it also comes with the server and uh, setting up the server is also not, not trivial. So I would say that 
doing those two things together, maybe will take you 10 days. So maybe five days to set up the client and five days to set up the server. Um, so it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty, takes quite a long, lot of effort. On Mac, there is a great framework called Sparkle. It's an auto update framework, which are, is used by a lot of applications. So I think for instance, Dropbox uses it. And um, the problem is uh, it's a library for an Objective-C library. And so it's not clear for us, if we're using Python, how to interface with an Objective-C library from Python. Um, but it is possible, it turns out it is possible. So once you figured out how do you package the Sparkle library uh, with your application, you have to put it into the right directory or else code signing will fail. Um, and once you figured out how to uh, interface, like how to call Objective-C from Python, it works, but I would say it, it'll take you five days. And also there's also a server com component, of course, because the updates have to be fetched from somewhere, but it's a bit, it's easier than for Omaha. So it's in, in, for Sparkle, it's an XML file with a special structure that you probably need to learn, but it's uh, a bit easier. And on Linux, there are different command line tools for every distribution. So on Ubuntu, there is um, a co command line tool called Rep Repro um, on, that lets you generate files for automatic updates on Arch, there is repo add, and on Fedora, there's create repo underscore C. And they all essentially create special uh, uh, folders with a special directory structure that contains uh, the files necessary for automatic updates. But so they all achieve the same task. But again, they're, they're all subtly different and you need to learn each of them if you do wish to natively um, support um, the uh, the, the distribution. And I do believe that you want to support, um, so you want to offer native packages, especially on Linux. So you want to, uh, on Ubuntu, for instance, you want to offer a dev file and you want your automatic update um, mechanism to use APT and the normal Ubuntu package manager, because especially Linux users are very um, particular about the things that are happening on, on their machines. So I know this from experience uh, with Fman I once uh, installed a background task in Linux that does automatic updates. And Linux users did not like this at all. And then I can understand, I was new to Linux at the time and I can understand why. So they, they don't want, they want to know what's going on on their machines and they also want to be in control, for instance, when updates are downloaded and installed. And so, especially on Linux, I strongly believe that you do want to support the native uh, packages. But also on, on Mac, I think you want to offer DMG files just because it's, I mean, not because they're so native, but it's because um, what people, uh, it's what people are used to. So anyways, the, each of these command line tools on Linux takes maybe two days to learn and set up. So in total, that's six days. And then finally, there are still some other things you want to do. Uh, for instance, you typically want your app to have a nice icon that is shown when you use press alt tab or command tab. And while there are cute APIs that let you set the icon, they don't work on Mac because uh, on Mac, the app icon is stored as a metadata information on your application's executable. So you have to figure out how to change this metadata. And I think it's done with a command line flag to pine installer. Um, but again, it takes maybe a day, probably a day if you're fast um, to, to set this up. Then there are resource files um, often applications want to ship data files, maybe an XML file or a config file or an image that's displayed in the application. So if you want to do that, then you need to figure out, okay, where, um, so my how does my code then access that file? 
And the problem is that there are two different cases. So one is when your app is running from source and the data file will lie in a certain location somewhere in your source tree. And the other case is when your app is running as a standalone app. So when it's installed on your user system, in that case, it will be in your app's installation directory, which is, which is of course a different path than from your source folder. Uh, so you want to, you need to figure out how do you organize the files and directories and then how do you transparently um, access these data files uh, in your code. So figuring this out is also necessary in, and maybe also takes a day or so. Um, then once your app is installed on the user's computer, um, you want to find out when errors and exceptions occur. So you may, uh, it's extremely useful to, you may not be able to reproduce all bugs. And if you have a stack trace, uh, then that's uh, extremely helpful uh, to fix them. And there are services that let's do this and many desktop applications anonymously send error information to a web server where you can then as the owner of that application um, or the author, the vendor, log in and inspect those stack traces and the errors and fix them. But this too needs to be set up. So it doesn't just come out of the box. Uh, you need to set it up yourself. Um, takes maybe another day. And then finally, uh, you want to host your applications binaries. I mean, you want to host the app setup.exe file, and you also want to host the Linux um, repositories. And you can't just upload them as a zip file somewhere because they have a very special directory structure and the package managers rely on that package uh, directory structure to be intact. So you need to figure out hosting. You probably need to um, set up a server or you may upload to Amazon AWS, for instance, but then you need to figure out um, the API for doing that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so I would say that this can take three days again, just setting up a server, maybe setting up a domain and so on and so forth. And then there are other, I mean, smaller tasks that um, are not as um, important, but you still will have to address uh, in the course of your journey of releasing your app. So if we add this all up, um, all the times we've seen all these numbers, uh, we've so far seen 41 days. If you work at, uh, for five days each week, then that's more than eight weeks or more than two months net. So that's if you work eight hours a day, are productive all the time, are not interrupted by meetings or phone calls or emails and so on and so forth. So in practice, I would say it's, it's a more likely to be three months or more. And I would like to take a second to pause and reflect on this number. Three months that we spend as software developers on tasks that are completely irrelevant to the core mission of our app. So it's 2019 and on mobile application, uh, on mobile phones, we have app stores and it's super easy. And on desktop applications, we, we spend months and we have to spend those months just to bring our app to our user systems. And um, I find this very, very frustrating. And because of this, um, I have open sourced the solutions I have had to create for FMAN in, F, in a library called FMAN Build System. It lets you reduce those three months to one day. And the only reason it's one day is that um, you, for, as I mentioned before, for code signing on Windows, you need to apply for a certificate and the bureaucracy involved takes a day. But if it weren't for that, then you could do it in a minute or, in, or not in one minute, in a few minutes. And I will show you an example on the next slide. So Afro Build System is a Python library. It's open source. Uh, the source code is on GitHub. Um, it's licensed under the GPL. Um, it also has a commercial license if the GPL is too restricted for you. And it supports both PySide 2 and PyQt. So it's targets, uh, strictly targets um, applications built using Python and Qt. And yeah, as I said, it saves you those months of time. Here's a brief example. Uh, this is for Linux. So if you, end, if you have Python 3 installed and Docker installed, then 
when you execute these commands that are shown here, you will produce the application whose screenshot is shown on the right in such a way that any user who is in this case on Ubuntu can install your app through their native package managers through APT and in such a way that when you release a new version with this FBS release command that is at the very bottom, they receive it automatically. So this does code signing, uploading to a repository, generating the repository, updating, uploading to a repository, setting an app icon, all the things that I mentioned, all the things that I just mentioned, you had to work months to attain in five minutes. And yes, this is what FPS does and lets you do. So in summary, um, Python and Qt, in my experience, are a fantastic combination. You get the speed of Qt with um, the productivity of Python. And you do not sacrifice much of the speed of Qt because Qt is written in C++ and Python only is only used relatively little of the time. And most of the time, processing time is spent inside Qt. We've also seen that desktop applications are hard and that hopefully FPS can save you a lot of the uh, necessary effort um, for creating them. If you'd like further information um, about FMAN, uh, then you can open, go to his homepage. Uh, it's fman.io. Uh, for further information about FPS, the build system, uh, Go to build-system.fmed.io. There you'll find the documentation and the tutorial. I mean, what I showed you was only very, very brief um, for time reasons, but you, you can do a tutorial there to see it for yourself. Um, here, there's also the link to the GitHub, so you can see the source code. And finally, if you'd uh, like to know, know more about me, uh, you can go to herman.io, H-E-R-R-M-A-N-N.io. And I'd also be very happy to uh, hear from you via email. So my email here is in the bottom right, uh, michael at herman.io. If you have any questions or comments, um, just reach out to me. I'd be very happy to reply. And with this, I'll hand it back over to Harold. And we have, I think we'll have a Q&A session. Yes. Thank you, Michael. Um, so we have approximately 10 minutes, or give or take. Uh, for questions. Uh, so not too many questions have appeared as oh now, but we have a few. So let's start with them. Um, you say that um, your build system is a GPL license. Uh, is there any limitations there for a build system under the GPL license? So the GPL normally requires any code that links to it dynamically to also be placed under the GPL. And that makes it uh, not viable for commercial projects because the GPL requires you to open source your code to also get the source code of your application to anyone who also obtains the application. But you might think FPS is a build system. So my app is only being built by it. It does not actually link to it. Um, so, I mean, that's, that might be an initial thought, um, but that's not how it works. Um, there are two reasons. Um, FPS has two components. One is the runtime, um, which you do need to link to in order for FPS to work. So by that, um, already you are covered or bound by the GPL. And the second reason is that as FPS packages your application, it adds some code that's required for certain features of FPS that uh, references um, the runtime. So even if you manage to somehow not uh, reference FPS's runtime in your code, uh, by the mere fact of using FPS to package your application, you will have introduced a dependency on FPS and are thus bound um, by the GPL. Okay, thank you. I think that was a good answer there. Um, then we have um, a question from Nate. So can you talk more about how you handle resource management with FPS? 
uh, where application, so for instance, where application resource files are located, handle in a cross-platform way, or using Qt's QRC system or something else. So because I'm using Python and it's a Python-based build system, I'm not using Qt's uh, QRC system. The way it works in FPS, FPS works a lot by uh, convention, naming conventions. So you, if you place your files, your resource files in certain directories in your source tree, uh, for, for instance, source slash main slash resources, um, then they automatically get copied into uh, your app's installation directory. So when you use install your app, installs your app, they automatically be there. And then FPS, the runtime, um, which is like the Python library that you can call from your own Python code, then gives you functions for locating those resource files. And these functions are transparently handled in both cases whether you're running from source or whether you're running uh, in the standalone version of your app. So the short answer is you put your resource files into a certain directory. FPS does all the rest. And in the Python code, you can say, give me the path to this file. And FPS figures out where the file is. It's super easy. And um, it's just uh, explained in the manual. And it also, it's also mentioned in FPS's tutorial. Great. I hope that answered the question. So perhaps a bit uh, simpler or maybe not, uh, who knows. Uh, you said that desktop apps are hard. Would you recommend Qt for Python for embedded devices? What's your take on that, Michael? And I can say mm -hmm. something afterwards, perhaps. So I... I must admit I do not have much experience with, or any experience with Qt for Python on Embedded. I wish it is to work well there and I wish it to, and I think it's cute, especially as a platform and as a GUI toolkit, has, uh, it's great for Embedded because it's very light in resources. Um, but I do not, and I, so my, the brief answer is I want it to work. I think Qt is well suited for it, but I do not, uh, currently have experience with it, but maybe Harvard, you can add something there yeah. as well. Yeah, I can add a little to that on the embedded side, of course. As Michael says, Qt is a very, very much used on embedded devices. Um, but of course, uh, the Python part and the Qt for Python, the combination is something we are working on. Um, it is not uh, something we call a supported solution at the moment, but uh, that will come in the future. Okay, follow-up question. Uh, Qt has many non-GUI classes for which Python, like QSockets, QFile, QNetwork, often offers an al alternative. Um, do you prefer using the Python alternatives or Qt in these cases? I prefer using the Python alternatives. Um, the main reason is that if you program in Python, then Python is essentially your host environment. And its libraries are optimized for being used from Python, which uh, Qt's APIs are not optimized for. I mean, they work well, of course, but it's not what they're optimized for. And so I would use Python's libraries. Yep, and I think that also makes, makes a lot of sense. Uh, so, so Qt is usually, in the Python use case, Qt is, uh, definitely best suited for the user interface parts. Mm. Of course, also the, the signaling between user interface and backend is also something Qt handles very well. Okay, uh, let's see, we still have a couple of minutes left. Um, so questions keep up popping in here, which is good. Let's see, can FBS be used to package a non-Python application, for instance, skipping the Py to X step? Um, I'm afraid, I mean, not out of the box, and it's not what it's designed for. FPS is explicitly designed for packaging and deploying apps based on Python and Qt. And it does a lot of 
all this, for instance, the resource handling that I mentioned is based on that presumption or that FPS is able to automatically set your application icon in a way that all you do is copy some images, your icon images into a certain folder and then FPS magically, I mean, not magically, but just sets them on your application on all operating systems. All these things require the assumption that FPS is based on Python. And, uh, and the app you're building is based on Python Q. So I'm afraid it's probably not possible. Thank you. Okay. Um, seems that we have time for uh, one last question at least. Um, and that will be um, whether FPS can deploy an application for a specific Python version and um, is there any limitations on Python versions supported by FPS today? Yes, uh, FPS supports Python versions 3.5 and 3.6 at the moment. I want to add support for 3.7 soon, um, but those are the main Python 3 versions that most people have nowadays. So. I would say it supports I mean, most of the main ones already. And it targets a, the Python version that you are using to invoke it. So FPS is just a Python library. It has a command line tool, but all the command line tool does is invoke some Python code with your current Python interpreter. So it uses whichever Python version you are currently using. Um, that's how you target uh, that's how you can essentially select the Python version which you want to target. Great. Okay, I think we, we have one last question that kind of also can be suitable as a rounding of this session. And uh, that question is perhaps not for you, Michael, but for, uh, for our host. And that will there be an online recording available for this talk? Oh, very good way to wrap it up, Harold. Um, yes, there will be an online recording available as well as the slides. Uh, we'll be sending that within the next couple of business days. So I think on that, um, I'm, you know, as the host here, I'll say thank you uh, to both Michael and Harold for taking the time out to do this today. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And um, we look forward to seeing all of you guys who have attended. Thank you for taking the time also to join us. Um, we look forward to seeing you on some future WAM webinars here that we will host at CUTE. Um, if you just look at our resources page, you will see updates on any future, future webinars and events that we have happening. So thank you again, everyone. And we'll be hearing from talking to you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.